Guangzhou, a city of commerce on China's southern coast that has been at the forefront of great changes. Thousands of years of contacts with the outside world have created a city with a rich history. While it is a shining example of a modern Chinese metropolis, people of this era still like to recall its glorious past. The passing of time reflects the glories of the city, but also make young people curious about its history. Xiao 我自己家里因为摆放了这么多东西,更像一个博物馆. In March 2018, Huang Siheng met Shane Matthew Harris, who shares his interest in Guangzhou's history. Wow. Ah, uh, this is our studio. <laughs> yeah, so this is the place you were telling me about, huh? Ah, uh, we collect the map, some ancient books. So all this stuff has to do with old Guangzhou, right? Yeah. Oh, awesome. Seeing how, how did you get all these kinds of objects? Yeah, actually they all from my father. Okay. They, he collected about 40 years. Wow. Show you something special. Huang Siheng's father found all these historical objects through painstaking efforts. These silent relics create a path to Guangzhou's past, leading Huang Siheng and Shane deep into its history. You can see the more detail about the Canton map. So this is the same one that we saw earlier, yeah, right? Yeah, in the beginning. Yeah. Cool. That one is the uh, Guangxiao Temple, mm -hmm. the Yuexiu Shan. OK, so it's like Yuexiu Park up here. Yeah, usually the uh, foreign people, they are not allowing to enter the city. Right. So they have to live around behind a wall. At this point, there's no 13 factories. Yes, after like 200 years, Mm -hmm. Then the 13 factory, they, they have a point at this left of bottom. 300 years ago, commerce in Guangzhou was centered in an area of the city known as the 13 factories. One of the most important merchants from the 13 factories was named Wu Bingjian, better known in the West as Haokua. He established the Iwo Hong, which engaged in silk fabrics, tea, and porcelain trade between China and the West. He was the largest creditor of the British East India Company and also supported the Forbes family after navigation lines opened between China and the U.S. There were stories that came down through my family. He was the person who took my great-great-grandfather and his brother under his wing mm -hmm. and was responsible for their success. Haokua was the most successful of the Hong merchants his investing a million dollars, the richest man in the world, in a number of industries, but chiefly in railroad. At the time, the Qing government implemented the Canton system, and Guangzhou was the only port open for trade. The 13 factories thus became the only government-franchised organization for foreign trade. Their annual tax reached over a million tails of silver. As the leader of the 13 factories merchants, Wu Bingjian was not only a legendary business figure, but also showed great humanity in his trade dealings with Westerners. In 1837, uh, as you know, there was a, a, a uh, disastrous um, economic collapse. One of my great-great-grandfather's colleagues owed a great deal of money to Hao Kua. We're talking $70,000. Realized he was stuck in China, essentially, for the rest of his life. Uh, to try and pay that back. Haokua asked him to come into his office and he tore it up, the IOU, in front of this man and said, your family needs you, go home. 
after the 13 factory era, most of their trading facilities and storage houses moved across the river to Honan. The major branches of the trading firms would open up offices here by selling things like tea and silk and some miscellaneous items from the West into China. The business miracle created by the 13 factories continues to enthrall young people from all over the world. As a student of Chinese history, Shane Matthew Harris has naturally become their guide. Looking back on the history of trade between East and West, they gain a deeper understanding of how open Guangzhou was all those centuries ago. I am from the United States, and I was born in 1990. For Guangzhou, Again, it's, a lot of it just happened when I came here. I only knew it was the third largest city in China. My city's maybe half a million people, so I liked the idea of going to a much bigger place than my hometown. So when I came to Guangzhou, what I found that struck me a lot was the city has so much modern architecture and places, but it melded very well with more older parts of town. You know, it's very easy to go from one district to another and it really is like you're, you're changing time periods. There you go. Oh, That's the yeah. part of the Shaman building. Yeah. This one is the, the Canton Club. Yes, it is. <laughs> Today it's at that, that big yellow building that's next to the, the bank. The Starbucks is all on the <laughs> 很惊讶,我给他看一些资料,他会很感兴趣,不停地去找,然后一个星期给我带来的就是那个人物背后的所有事情。Wow, oh, that's lost picture over there. So then I just started plugging into Google. A lot of it is actually free, just nobody reads them. They're so outdated. It's not something most people tend to want to look for. Siheng really cares about Canton's history and preserving it and telling its stories. And that touches me very deeply to know that there are people here who do care. What is your favorite about the Xiguan area? Well, I like, I think my favorite spot is... Xiguan was under the jurisdiction of Nanhai County during the Ming and Qing dynasties. It is an important landmark of Guangzhou's modern history and has not only witnessed the rise and fall of the 13 factories, but also the arrival of modern industry. The Li Wan Museum in Xiguan was formerly the home of Chen Qiyuan, founder of the Ji Chang Long Filature and pioneer of the nation's modern industry. In 1873, Chen Qiyuan founded the first machine reeling filature in China, financed by national capital. With machines replacing manual labor, there was a drastic increase in exports of raw silk in Guangzhou. But this was not the first business miracle Chen Qiyuan created. 23 years earlier, he went to Saigon with nothing, but then bought half of Guangdong Street by virtue of his ability to survive. Chen Qiyuan is a very special person. They normal man of South China. Chen Qi Yuan had unique business insights. During his investigation tour to Southeast Asia, which was still under colonial rule at the time, he saw the steam silk reeling machine from France for the first time. He suddenly realized that Western industrial civilization was coming to China. He managed to bring this technology back home simply by observing and memorizing it. Nazi 
，有几次就当垃圾扔掉了。但是我爸他很清楚自己在干什么，因为他在广州长大，不论这是一个电表或者保险箱。只要有“广州”两个字的，他都觉得很有价值。所有他收回来的很旧的物品，他总能发掘到里面的故事。So this is like the, the science and medicine kind of corner over here. Yeah, the bottom line, medicine. Nice. This one looks interesting. What's what's this yeah, one? Yeah, it's mm -hmm. uh, from a bank. About the 1920, you insert the check mm -hmm. and punch the area number. Oh, so you turn have. it like this, yeah. right? Yeah. And then punch it here? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so is this foreign made or was this made here? That is made from the US. Oh, really? Yeah, it's it. Oh. Yeah. The foreign-made objects that Huang Sihung and Shane are looking at come from an era when communication between Eastern and Western civilizations had just begun. At the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, technological achievements from the West streamed into China. But one Cantonese man was spreading Oriental wisdom in the field of agriculture outside the country. In 1918, Dai Zonghan from Runhe Town, Guangzhou, bought the cheapest ticket available for a boat to Peru. He was only 16, and life in Peru was quite tough to begin with. He started working as a handyman, and after more than 20 years, with the capital he accumulated, he started to cultivate wasteland for farming. At the time, Peruvians mainly lived on potatoes and corn, and rice was a rare sight. The fried rice that was common in China was an unusual delicacy in Peru, but only because local people lacked rice cultivation technology. Milo is a poor country. In the farming sense, it's not good. Milo people, when they grow up, are very simple. They use a hook, put a hole in the ground, and put the seeds on the ground. They have a new house. If you eat milo, you can eat it with a few farmers. If you eat it with a few farmers, you have to eat it with a few farmers. Dai Zonghan brought Chinese planting technology to local people. He adjusted it to local conditions and built the curved field ridge, solving the problem of water shortages while also improving the variety and yield of crops. Y este para economizar el agua, creo que ahí este así es curva de curva de nivel, posada el agua. Claro, mejor la posa queda grande. Dai Zonghan spread rice cultivation technology to both the coastal and mountain areas. Because of his contribution, the Peruvian government awarded him the prestigious National Agricultural Medal in 1968. Today, there are thousands of Chinese restaurants in Peru. On almost every street of the capital, Lima, there is a Chinese restaurant named Chirfa, which comes from the word for dining in Cantonese. The Peruvians who enjoy fried rice in these restaurants will always remember Dai Zonghan as their country's father of rice. The <laughs> Dai 
Guangzhou's openness for the last 1,000 years has not only left it with a unique business legacy and major achievements in science and technology, but also spiritual wealth left behind from previous talents. For Huang Sihang, the old objects his father collected seemed to contain cultural codes of a history that he was strongly attached to. That I 他好像很害怕这些东西会消失And this one is uh, the China Illustrate. It's a different year, like the 1840. Wow, yeah. okay. So we're about a couple hundred years later then. Yes. Ooh, this is interesting. Yeah, that is the opera. But it looks like you yeah. take a look at their faces. Yeah, having a high nose and small eyes. That's yeah. what the foreigners <laughs> recognize Chinese. Yeah, it definitely is not yeah. Asian features. Because he, he never been to China, so Oh, yeah. so it's kind of a combination of yeah. what details he does know with sort of what exactly. he does. Exactly, yeah. How are Cantonese people different from, say, other people in China? I would tell, like, uh, the Cantonese more concerned about uh, the, the food uh -huh. and the pace. Guangzhou has a unique food culture and is known worldwide for its delicacies. Cantonese cuisine is an important part of Lingnan culture, which also includes kung fu, lion dance, and dragon dance. Merchant ships brought these Chinese traditions to Southeast Asia and took root in Chinese families there. Chinese New Year is the most important festival and the best preserved tradition among overseas Chinese. For thousands of years, Cantonese people sailed south to start businesses in Southeast Asia. One of them was Huang Huayan, founder of the Kawan Lama Group, a leading retailer and importer in Indonesia. Huang Huayan came to Indonesia in 1938. Through a combination of skill, resilience, and diligence, he opened a hardware store in the Chinatown there. Through painstaking efforts, Huang Huayan's hardware store gradually expanded. In 1976, he officially handed the Kawan Lama hardware store to the 20-year-old Huang Yijun and his siblings. Very strong, very powerful team. Yan 
开始好像一个小鸟开始可以飞了，所以去国外找产品，跟大家接触，学了不少。By looking for products abroad, Kunkoro Wibowo means the Canton Fair. At the beginning of the 1990s, he began looking for trade partners based on Indonesia's economic development and its consumption per capita. He turned his attention to China and in 1995 attended the Canton Fair for the first time. He has since attended the fair every year for the last 23 years. 我第一次参加广教会的时候是一九五五年，广教会是在柳花宾馆，在那边人山人海。我记得那时候跟中国做生意是不容易的事，去看产品，当场要下个订单回来了，很难的，因为那个电话啦、fax 啦都很难的沟通。The first Canton Fair was also known as the China Import and Export Fair and was held in Guangzhou in 1957. For a long time, the fair was the main channel for China's foreign trade. It also served as an important window for overseas Chinese to communicate with their homeland. 很适合印尼这样的发展中的国家。几年前，中国的货就是说低档货、便宜，用不着几次就坏掉。但是这个印象现在已经变了。So before you came, what would you expect that Guangzhou is? So I didn't think Guangzhou would be as big as it is now. I think for most Americans, especially if you were born in the 90s, probably the understanding we have of China was probably through movies like Mulan. In my mind, China was a very ancient place, and we really didn't know much. So when I was coming out here, I, I had this very vague concept of what life might be like out here and you know what might be different from what I had imagined. Last time, you might be missed our exhibition. I can show you right now in the VR. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's the whole angle. Oh. We always want to make old things, how to expand, to make more people easily accept. Especially in our generation, the 80s, 90s, everyone is busy with work. There are a lot of things that are missing. A lot of research. Yeah, yeah. So this is where you're going to be telling the story about? Yes, it's our new exhibition here. I think what Si Heng and I are doing is continuing a tradition that started since the late 1700s. Yeah. We've had merchants and people coming and learning about China and Canton. It's really the first time you have two sides of the world meeting each other. I find it cool that I'm kind of part of history, really, is I'm, I'm doing the same thing that they were doing. From the Maritime Silk Road to the 13 factories. From the beginning of modern industry to the Canton Fair. This coastal city has been a thriving business hub for centuries. Guangzhou has been shaped by its openness to culture and trade, making it a city of generosity and tolerance. During the reform and opening up in the new era, China embraced the world once again. Guangzhou played a pioneering role as a city that has always been a step ahead of the rest. <laughs>